Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Opening the doors of the shopping center, Miranda took a deep breath and squinted her eyes against the bright sun. Wow. It feels like summer just arrived today, and it's already so hot outside. And it's so beautiful, it takes your breath away. The bushes that line the road are neatly trimmed, and the ground is covered in fresh greenery. Miranda smiled. She didn't even realize that summer had come. She had been preoccupied with other things. She rarely went outside, only when it was absolutely necessary, like when they ran out of groceries. Like today, for example. Well, that's it, the young woman thought, time to hurry to catch the bus. I've wasted so much time. Ms. Tina has been alone for quite a while now. The handles of the huge bags loaded with groceries dug into her palms, but Miranda tried not to pay attention to that, trying to remember if she had forgotten anything on the way. Oh well, she stopped abruptly in the middle of the sidewalk, and what about the adult diapers? Yes, I remembered them all the way, but it slipped my mind at the shopping center. Should I go back? She looked wearily at the bags. I don't want to carry them around. Should I leave them at the storage locker? But that will take so much time. And there might be a queue at the checkout as well. Miranda spotted the bus she needed approaching the stop. No, I won't go back. Besides, it's a bad omen, she decided, quickening her pace. As the woman started climbing the steps of the bus, someone literally snatched a bag from her hands. She flinched and looked up to see a well-dressed man smiling at her. Let me help you, miss, he offered. Is it heavy? I can see that it is. Miranda smiled modestly, thanked the kind stranger, handed him the bags, and boarded the bus, standing by the window. He placed the bags next to her. Miss, she chuckled to herself. Well, in my forties and still being called Miss. It's quite pleasant. The man looked her over appreciatively. From his perspective, she could easily pass for a young woman. Petite, fragile, with a messy bun of red hair on the back of her head. But her face, oh, her face. It revealed her age. Tired, with dark circles under her eyes, clearly not getting enough sleep. Life must not be a piece of cake for her, he thought. Miranda didn't notice that she was being observed. Her mind was occupied with something else, and she decided to call her husband. Alex, I'm sorry, I know you're probably busy, but I just don't know what to do. I bought everything, I'm on the bus back home, and I remember that I forgot to buy diapers for your mom. And we only have a few left at home, two or three. Maybe you can stop by the store after work and get them, huh? Yes, Alex, I know you reminded me, and I remember about the lists, but I forgot to write it down. Yes, of course, Alex. It is what it is. I agree, I've been absent-minded, but I thought I would remember everything, and look what happened. Next time, I'll definitely do everything as you say. So, will you stop by? Will you buy them? No. Why not? Miranda fell silent, listening attentively to the person on the other end of the line, and then replied softly. Okay. I'll try calling Laura now. She ended the call and immediately dialed her daughter's number. Laura answered in a whisper because she was in the middle of a lecture. The young woman was in her final year of studies. Yes, mom, she hissed irritably. What? What did you forget to buy? Yes, of course, I'll go right after my classes. Don't worry, I won't forget. Okay, bye. I'm busy. Turning off her phone and holding it close to her chest, Miranda let out a relieved sigh, but then she quickly realized. She was approaching her stop, she still had to pass it, and then drag the bags back. Hastily grabbing the bags, she saw a bottle of kefir fall out of one of them, but the man who had helped her with the bags didn't hesitate and came to her aid again. Thanking him once more with a grateful smile, Miranda jumped off the bus and waved her hand in gratitude towards the departing vehicle as she briskly walked towards home. Miranda lived in a huge two-story house that her father-in-law had built with his own hands. 
However, the construction had severely affected his health, and nine years ago he passed away, and some time later, the illness caught up with her mother-in-law. Nobody expected that. Ms. Tina had been an active, energetic woman all her life. She did morning exercises, ate well, and led an active lifestyle. From the outside, it seemed like she was overflowing with health, but that wasn't the case. Pausing at the front door, Miranda took a deep breath. She desperately wanted to believe that nothing terrible had happened in her absence. However, upon opening the door, the smell told Miranda that her hopes had been shattered. A strong odor of human excrement hit her nose. Oh no. Miranda groaned mentally. Why does Miss Tina constantly remove her diaper? When will all of this end? But it turned out to be much worse. The elderly woman not only took off her diaper but also smeared the contents all over the walls of the kitchen and living room. She wandered around the kitchen with a detached expression. Mom, how much longer? Miranda scolded her, placing the bags on the table. I asked you to lie down quietly until I returned. But do I really have to restrain you? Who are you? Her mother-in-law glared at her with a malicious expression. Are you spying on me? Do you want to kill me? She immediately rushed to the cutlery drawer and frantically rummaged through it, keeping an alert eye on her daughter-in-law. Of course, she was looking for a knife, but Miranda had prudently hidden them all a long time ago. Pulling out the first thing she could find, which happened to be a fork, the sick woman headed towards Miranda. Get out, she hissed. Or you'll regret it. Looks like I'll have to give her an injection again, Miranda thought. Another episode of aggression. For about 40 minutes, the young woman did everything she could to lull the vigilance of the elderly woman, until she managed to get close enough to administer the injection. After that, her mother-in-law calmed down and allowed her daughter-in-law to lead her to the shower to clean up. The house was filled with a strong odor. It was difficult to breathe, and Miranda wanted to clean everything as quickly as possible and open all the windows and doors. However, her mother-in-law regained her appetite and Miranda couldn't leave her hungry. When the meal was coming to an end, Laura returned from her studies with two large packs of diapers in her hands. Why does it smell so unpleasant again? Is grandma causing trouble? Laura asked. Yes, Miranda sighed sadly. She caused trouble while I was at the store. Don't worry, mom, the young woman smiled. We'll clean everything and air it out. All right, you must be tired. Go eat and rest. I'll clean up myself. Don't worry about me. I'm not tired at all. But with these aromas, my appetite disappeared, her daughter laughed. I'll just grab some gloves now. By the way, how are you feeling? She looked attentively at her mother. I'm fine, Miranda lied. She didn't want to worry her daughter and decided to keep silent about the fact that she had already taken two painkiller pills today and felt that she would soon need a third one. Despite their efforts, the women couldn't completely get rid of the unpleasant smell in the house by the time the head of the family arrived. Alex wrinkled his nose as soon as he stepped inside. Ugh. What's that smell, he grimaced, pinching his nose with his fingers. Miranda, you're home all the time, isn't it hard to take care of mom? I'm exhausted like a dog after work, and now I have to endure all this. I thought I'd come home, relax peacefully, have dinner, but instead, it smells like a public toilet. What can I do? Miranda shrugged. I told you in the morning that the fridge is empty. Should I cook something out of nothing? You're always at work, even weekends are occupied. What am I supposed to do? Where should I put Miss Tina? Take her with me? And besides, Laura and I have cleaned everything. The smell will dissipate soon. Alex fell silent. There was nothing to argue about but her words left an unpleasant feeling in his heart. You know what, Miranda, I'll have dinner at a cafe. I can't stay in these conditions. Miranda, after putting her mother-in-law to bed and taking a shower, went to the bedroom, but sleep eluded her. Her headache was excruciating again. The painkillers only provided temporary relief. She suffered through the whole night and realized that today wouldn't be easy either. 
From early morning, the sound of clattering dishes echoed in the kitchen. Accustomed to the outbursts of her sick mother-in-law, Miranda got up, put on her robe, and entered the kitchen to find her smashing plates with a sinister smile, hurling them onto the floor. Thank goodness Alex and Laura have already left, Miranda thought to herself. Alex always expressed dissatisfaction when she couldn't keep up with taking care of his mother. He had repeatedly hinted that the sick woman could be placed in a specialized facility, and then everyone would find it easier to live. However, Miranda strongly disagreed with her husband on that matter. Alex, how can you even say such things? She's your mother, and she's not alone, she has us. No, I won't send her anywhere. Miranda objected passionately. But you can't handle her either, the man disagreed with his wife's arguments. You even had to switch to remote work because of her. Well, first of all, it's not quitting, it's transitioning to remote mode. It's not the same thing at all. Besides, I haven't lost anything in terms of money, and I'm doing just fine. Don't forget, we all live in Ms. Tina's house. She's a very kind and caring person, and she has helped us so much. I see you've forgotten all that. Yes, I remember. I remember everything, muttered the husband. I'm just tired of living like this. It's becoming unbearable. She's irrational, she doesn't recognize us, and we need qualified help for her. No, Alex. The matter is closed. I won't let you heartlessly get rid of your own mother. Miranda turned away, indicating that the conversation was over. At that moment, Alex waved his hand dismissively, but he still brought up his idea during Miranda's most difficult moments. However, his wife stubbornly stood her ground. Miranda took a deep breath, wincing from the intense headache that worsened with the crashing sound of broken dishes, and headed towards her mother-in-law. After calming the woman down, she began to clean up. Then Miranda remembered that today was the last day to submit a report, and it was only halfway done. Her head was splitting into pieces. Miranda had long switched to the strongest over-the-counter painkillers available at the pharmacy, but even they provided relief only briefly. Recently, nausea and ringing in her ears had joined the headaches, and sometimes Miranda saw double. She kept silent about these symptoms because she knew her family would worry, especially her daughter, who would insist on medical tests. But when? Who would take care of poor Ms. Tina? Especially since Alex had already suggested sending her to a medical facility, and he definitely wouldn't take care of her himself. After two hours, the mother-in-law finally calmed down and went to her room to watch TV. The house fell into a long-awaited silence, and Miranda took advantage of the situation to continue working on her accounting report. However, as soon as she sat down at her desk, there was a quiet knock on the door, and her mother-in-law entered the room, as quiet as a mouse. Miranda looked at her with surprise. Miranda, I would like to talk to you, her mother-in-law said. Mom, can't we postpone the conversation? I really need to finish the report urgently. But considering my condition, it might not be possible later, Ms. Tina replied, smiling slightly. Let's do it now while I still have some clarity of mind. Miranda looked attentively at the elderly woman and, smiling, closed her laptop, indicating that she was ready to listen. Ms. Tina occasionally had moments of clarity, and today was one of them. Her speech was clear during such moments, and her gaze was meaningful. Seeing that Miranda was willing to listen, her mother-in-law immediately grabbed a chair, placed it opposite Miranda, and lowered her eyes as if she didn't know where to start. Miranda, I wanted to let you know that I have bequeathed our house to Laura. Please, don't be angry with me for this. I'm not foolish, I understand what's happening to me, I'm aware of dementia and where it will ultimately lead. That's why, when the first symptoms appeared, I immediately went to a notary and made the will. But don't think that I wasn't in a sound state of mind at that time. Everything was done legally. I don't understand why I should be upset with you, Miranda replied, smiling slightly. It's your right, and you decide how to dispose of your own property. Besides, Laura is my daughter. But, honestly, what surprises me is why her. Why not Alex? He's your son. You know, Miranda, I love you and my granddaughter very much. 
Of course, I also love my son, but he's, how should I put it, a very peculiar person. Do you think I don't hear your conversations or don't understand them? I understand everything, and I know that if it weren't for you, he would have long put me in some nursing home and would live carefree. After my death, in the absence of a will, he would have inherited this house, but I don't know how your life will unfold in the future, and I'm sure that you wouldn't be left on the streets in case something happens. Laura is such a sweet girl, kind-hearted, just like you. Anyway, I won't distract you any longer. That's basically all I wanted to tell you, and I'm glad you're not against it. I have a copy of the will in my dresser. Well, get back to work. With that, her mother-in-law returned the chair to its place and quietly left, leaving Miranda deep in thought. She didn't know how to respond, and honestly, Miranda had never considered what would happen when Miss Tina was no longer around. It would have been natural for Alex to inherit the house, but she completely turned everything around. Well, if that's what the owner herself decided, so be it, although it's strange when a mother doesn't trust her own son. No one is perfect, of course, we all have our flaws, and Alex is no exception. Miranda decided to get back to work and opened her laptop. Unexpectedly, the noise in her ears suddenly intensified and became unbearable. She quickly covered her ears with her hands. Immediately, her vision became blurry, and the image started to distort. Laura came home and unintentionally listened for a moment, silence. That was extremely rare. Great, the girl rejoiced. Now I can relax peacefully and start preparing for my exams. Laura walked into her room, took a shower, and when she entered the living room, she looked around. It was suspiciously quiet. Her mom, who always hurried to greet and feed her little girl, was nowhere to be found. Where could she have gone? But where? Lately, she hardly ever left the house. Laura peeked into her grandmother's room, she was dozing off in the armchair with the TV on. Her mom wasn't there either. The girl started to worry. She opened the door to the room where her mom usually worked and froze in place at what she saw. A chill ran down her spine. Her mother was lying on the floor next to a fallen chair. Papers were scattered all over the floor, it seemed like her mom had tried to grab onto something while falling. In the end, everything ended up on the floor. In a single leap, Laura rushed to her mother, slapping her cheeks, trying to bring her back to consciousness, but it was all in vain. Her mother was breathing, but she didn't regain consciousness. Only the emergency medical team that Laura immediately called could provide help. When Miranda regained consciousness and opened her eyes, she groaned and grabbed her head with both hands. Is your head hurting? The doctor asked. My mom always has a severe headache, quickly replied Laura on her mother's behalf. I see. What did the examination show? What diagnosis have the doctors given you? I haven't been examined, Miranda barely whispered, grimacing in pain. I don't have time for that. I have my sick mother to take care of, she has dementia. I understand, there are always things more important than one's own health, the doctor nodded. And how long have you been experiencing these headaches? For about three years, Miranda shrugged. It started off tolerable, and the medication helped, but now it's simply unbearable. In addition, there's the ringing in my ears, blurry vision, everything becomes distorted, and I experience occasional nausea. Why didn't you tell me anything, mom, exclaimed a shocked Laura. Most likely, she didn't want to worry you, the doctor speculated. Am I right? He turned to Miranda, who nodded affirmatively before grabbing her head again in pain. What a familiar story. Get ready quickly, we're going to the hospital. Given your condition, you urgently need examination and hospitalization. Alex was nervous since the morning. He was already late for work, and his mother was once again in an unstable state, not recognizing him and being aggressive. He couldn't leave her alone. His daughter had gone to take a shower and also disappeared. He knocked on the bathroom door. Laura, are you almost ready? Yes, all done, the girl replied, opening the door. Why is everyone so impatient? She walked past her father, but he grabbed Laura's hand. Wait, he said. I have a request for you. Could you stay home today and look after your grandmother? 
There's no one else to watch over her. I'm running late for work. No, dad, I have an exam today, I can't miss it. But you can simply take a day off. I think it's time for you to start taking care of your mother. She freed her hand and quickly went to her room to change. Alex stared at his daughter in bewilderment. What did she mean, take a day off? What if his mother causes trouble or makes a mess? Would he have to clean up after her? A man, he was completely unprepared for such a turn of events. Laura hurriedly left the house, paying no attention to her suddenly saddened father. She had no time for him right now. She was hardly prepared for the exam either because all her thoughts were with her mother, whom the ambulance had taken away yesterday. Tears welled up in Laura's eyes once again as she recalled how awful her mother looked. Amidst the daily hustle, she hadn't noticed it before, but yesterday she looked at her differently. Thin, pale, dark circles under her eyes. After finishing the exam, the girl rushed out of the institute building and hurried to the hospital. The taxi arrived quickly, and fortunately, there was no traffic. At the hospital, she was allowed to go up to the ward since Miranda couldn't get up. When Laura entered the room, she could barely hold back her emotions and tears at what she saw. Her mother lay on the bed, a sheet pulled up to her chin, and the color of her face blended with the sheet. Laura had never seen her mother in such a painful state. How had they not noticed all of this before? And yet, her mother managed to do it all, manage the household, work, and take care of her sick grandmother. Hi, Imam, Laura whispered softly, kissing her mother on the cheek. In response, Miranda weakly smiled. What are the doctors saying? Did they do an MRI? Instead of answering, Miranda turned away and sniffled. Mom, are you crying? Is everything really that bad? Her daughter became worried. I don't know, I hope not. They found a tumor in my head. They said we'll treat it. Mom, I feel like you're not telling me everything. What kind of tumor? How will they treat it? I don't know, Miranda sighed heavily. They said they need to conduct further tests and take a bunch of blood tests, but don't worry, I'll manage. Tell me, how is your grandmother? Who's with her now? Well, when I left for the institute, dad stayed with her. He wanted me to stay, but I told him to take a day off and take care of his own mother. Oh, I hope he doesn't leave her alone, Miranda sighed. I can't even imagine how you'll manage now. I'll be in the hospital for a long time. They won't release me anytime soon. Yes, mom, we'll manage. We're not little kids anymore. The most important thing is for you to get treated. We need you healthy. They continued chatting about unrelated topics for a while, but as Laura listened to her mother's distant voice, her worries grew stronger. She had a definite impression that her mom was hiding something, and the girl decided to find out everything on her own. Leaving the room, she sought out the attending doctor. It turned out to be a cheerful man in his mid-forties. However, as soon as he realized whose daughter stood before him, the smile instantly vanished from his face. So, you're Miranda's daughter. Unfortunately, I can't give you any good news. We discovered a tumor in your mother's brain. I can't say for certain yet, until we conduct further tests and additional examinations, but judging by the enlarged lymph nodes, the tumor is malignant, and, on top of that, it's inoperable. It's too late, you see. Time is a precious resource, and it's been wasted. Why didn't your mother come to us sooner? For three years, she suffered from headaches and stayed at home. If she had come earlier, we would have removed everything, but now, he helplessly shrugged, looking at the bewildered girl in front of him. If the malignancy is confirmed, your mother will be transferred to the oncology department, and she'll be prescribed chemotherapy. Laura lowered her head and stared at the floor. She was in such shock that she didn't even know what else to ask the doctor. And this chemotherapy, will it help my mom get better? I won't give you false hope. With this diagnosis, as my many years of practice have shown, there is no hope of recovery. All we can do is support her life, but nobody knows how long it will last. Laura emerged from the ward feeling lost. Tears blurred her vision so much that she couldn't see the road. 
Everything was swirling. At first, she wanted to go back to her mother's room, but then she realized that she wouldn't be able to hold back her emotions and would start sobbing right there. She was already on the verge of a breakdown. So, turning 180 degrees, she quickly left the department. At home, her angry father awaited her. Laura, thank God you showed up. Where have you been all this time? Your grandmother caused such a mess, I couldn't clean it up myself. I need your help. And where were you all this time? Why weren't you looking after her, the tearful daughter retorted. Did you just leave her alone? Well, of course. I can't sit with her all day like I'm tied to her. And then the man took a closer look at his daughter and asked. Laura, have you been crying? What happened? Did you fail an exam? And I see that you're not interested in mom's condition at all, the girl smirked. Isn't that what you should have asked about first? Well, I'll tell you anyway. The doctor said she has a tumor in her brain, most likely malignant and inoperable. The time has been wasted. But we'll still fight for mom, right, dad? The daughter looked at her father with tear-filled eyes, her voice trembling. Are we going to save our mom? Tell me. Well, how are we going to save her, the man blinked, if the doctors refuse to operate on her. But there are other clinics, we can take her abroad. Maybe the doctors there will take her. She's not the first with this diagnosis. Look how many cases they show on TV. Our doctors refuse, but foreign doctors do everything. Alex lowered his head and remained silent. He didn't know what to say to his daughter. Dad, why are you just standing there? Go to mom. I'm surprised you didn't do it this morning instead of me. She's waiting for you, and you should support her. I'll clean up everything here myself. Yes, yes. Of course. The man rushed towards the bedroom to change, but then he froze in his tracks and looked at his daughter with confusion. What do I tell her, Laura? Does she know about her diagnosis? What should I talk to her about? How should I behave? Dad, you're an adult. You and mom have been together for so many years, do I have to teach you? She sighed. Support her. Maybe she'll talk to you. She didn't tell me anything, but you should be there for her in such a moment. Alex was pacing in place, unsure of how to proceed. I also thought of something, he suddenly said. Since mom is in the hospital and feeling so unwell, what about grandma? Who will take care of her? Maybe we'll have to move her to a nursing home. Are you out of your mind, exclaimed Laura. There are two of us, and we'll manage. Mom handled everything on her own. Dad, be patient for a little longer. Take some time off from work. I have a couple of weeks left to finish my studies, and then I'll take care of grandma. Everything will work out. The most important thing now is to get mom back on her feet. So, why are you standing there like a statue? Go to mom. Yes, yes, I'm going, the man fumbled. Miranda was overjoyed to see Alex. She reached out to him, and he approached, taking her hands in his and gently sitting on the edge of the bed. The man felt extremely awkward, he had never been in such situations before and didn't know what to say. But Miranda saved the situation. Alex, I won't hide it. Things are not good for me. I didn't want to tell Laura, but they found a tumor, and there's nothing they can do about it anymore. No one knows how much time I have left, but I can feel it's not much. Laura knows everything. She spoke with your attending physician. Well, that's even better. Sooner or later, she would have had to be told anyway. Alex, I'm so scared. I don't want to leave you. Miranda, I was thinking, maybe we can look for other doctors, maybe there are some who would take on such an operation, the man recalled his daughter's words. If there's even a slight chance, I'm willing to fight, Miranda weakly smiled. Snowflakes fell from the sky, swirling gently in the air. Laura cupped her hands under the snow, leisurely walking down the street. Around her, store windows sparkled and shimmered with colorful decorations for the upcoming new year. Passersby hurriedly made their last-minute purchases. It was December 31st, 
and everyone was rushing to set the festive table to celebrate the holiday joyfully. However, Laura didn't rush. This holiday didn't promise to be cheerful for her, even though her mom tried so hard to create a festive atmosphere at home. She even made dad buy a Christmas tree and decorated it herself, overcoming the pain, pretending that everything was fine. But all these New Year preparations made Laura want to cry. Suddenly, this New Year might turn out to be the last one she would spend with her mom. In a very short period, their lives had drastically changed, and not for the better. They used to live carefree lives, but now their lives had entered a period of loss and sorrow. Six months ago, they said, goodbye, to grandma. Laura went to visit her mother in the hospital and stayed there longer than usual, but the girl was calm because dad was with grandma. However, as always, he left her alone without realizing what he was doing and left the gas stove on. When Laura returned home earlier than her father and opened the front door, a sharp smell struck her nose. Grandma, she screamed, rushing into the house. But it was already too late. Miss Tina, the girl's grandmother, was found lying on the floor in the kitchen. She was next to the stove. Laura still didn't understand where she found the strength back then to pull her grandmother out of the house. In the courtyard, she tried to bring the elderly woman to her senses, but all her efforts were in vain. Laura was very angry at her father for his carelessness. How could he leave grandma alone? But the man seemed oblivious to his guilt. However, when he found out that his mother had left the house to his granddaughter in her will, he wasn't just angry, he was furious. What? How could this happen, he shouted. She was insane. This will is invalid. Laura, you should understand that this will has no legal force. Mother wasn't in her right mind lately. Renounce it, don't accept the inheritance. I should inherit this house. It's mine, you understand? And it would be fair. My father built this house, I put so much effort into it. You're my daughter. Can I really drive you out of here? But then Miranda stepped in to defend her daughter. She won't renounce anything. It was your late mother's wish, and I don't understand why you're so upset. I knew about her decision, and the will was drafted when dementia was in its early stages. So, Alex, you just need to come to terms with this harsh reality for you. Laura looked at her parents, and she couldn't care less. She mourned her grandmother, worried deeply about her mother, and couldn't care less about some inheritance. I can renounce it if it makes you feel better, she shrugged indifferently. Yes, it would be easier, Alex immediately perked up. No, you won't renounce it, Miranda insisted. It was Miss Tina's will, and we'll leave everything as it is. And Laura sided with her mother, so the house where the family currently lived would be hers. Approaching the house, the girl quickened her pace. Her mother was waiting for her there. She tried to put on a joyful expression and entered inside. Hi, mom, Laura called out. I bought everything. Let's set the table. Miranda was in the bedroom at that moment and quickly hid the syringe with which she administered her next dose of painkillers. Laura shouldn't know how bad things were for her mother. They had to endure this evening and not spoil the holiday. Miranda really wanted to celebrate it with her family because she also understood that it could be the last one. And where is dad, the girl wondered. Hasn't he come back from work yet? No, the mother shook her head. But I called him 20 minutes ago, he said he'll be back soon. Laura, tie this scarf on my head, beautifully, like you know how. And Miranda handed her daughter a silk scarf. Laura approached her mother from behind and started wrapping the scarf around her mother's bald head due to chemotherapy. She smiled with all her might, holding back her tears. Her mother had become very thin. She was always a petite woman, but now she was just skin and bones. There were no eyebrows or eyelashes on her pale face, but she didn't give up. And Laura wouldn't give up either. She would support her mother in everything and smile until the very end. Later, they set the festive table, their favorite Soviet film playing on the television. Alex called and informed them that he would be delayed a little longer. Laura was very angry with her father for his behavior. Since her mother's illness, he had been coming home less frequently, 
moving to another room and justifying his decision by saying that he couldn't sleep next to a wife who constantly suffered from pain, tossing and moaning. But Laura understood that the problem went beyond lack of sleep. The man simply didn't know how to behave with his wife, what to say. He couldn't look her in the eyes, encourage her, support her, so he found a perfect solution in distancing himself, just as he did in the situation with their grandmother. He seemed to be there, yet not quite. At first, Laura tried to reach out to her father, but then she realized it was futile. I can't, whether you understand it or not, I can't, Alex insisted to his daughter. We all understand perfectly well how this whole story will end. All the doctors refused to operate on her. And what am I supposed to tell her now, Miranda, don't worry, you'll get better. We'll cure you. She's not a fool, and she understands everything perfectly well. So, what's the point of empty promises? But dad, we simply have to support her. We're her family, Laura pleaded. And I'm here, but that's the maximum I can do. Don't ask for more from me. Laura nodded and lowered her head so that her father wouldn't notice the tears that instantly welled up in her eyes. She understood that another conversation with her father yielded no results. Today, Alex came home closer to 11 p.m. and sat at the table as if fulfilling a duty. Miranda tried to make jokes and lighten the mood, but her husband never supported her attempts. Laura didn't take her eyes off her mother. From her appearance, she could tell that it was becoming increasingly difficult for her mother to stay at the table with them, but she held on like a steadfast soldier. Mom, maybe you should lie down, Laura couldn't hold back. Is it hurting a lot? No, my dear, don't worry. I'll stay until midnight, and we'll all celebrate the new year together, the woman smiled. Maybe we should give you a painkiller injection? Laura suggested. Now that's a good idea. I won't refuse a little shot, Miranda laughed. Miranda decided not to tell her daughter that she had already taken a painkiller before her arrival. Laura glanced briefly at her father, but he sat there with a detached look, staring at the television, pretending not to hear the conversation between his daughter and wife. After the president's speech and the chimes, Miranda drank a glass of champagne and got up from the table. Well, that's great. Now I think I'll go lie down. Laura, let's clean up everything tomorrow, okay? Yes, don't worry, mom, I'll take care of everything myself. Go rest. Miranda escorted her mother to the bedroom, helped her get under the covers, and quietly left. Laura's father, still wearing his jacket, stood at the table and packed something into a bag. Where are you going, the daughter asked in surprise. To my friends, the man grumbled. Do you really think I'm going to sit at home on New Year's? And if mom wakes up, how am I supposed to explain your absence to her? Laura, did I celebrate New Year with you guys? What more do you want from me? I was invited somewhere tonight, but I turned it down for you. Your mother is dying, but I'm alive, and I don't have to be tied to her side, and by the way, neither do you. Do you have nowhere else to spend the holiday? The father challenged his daughter with a gaze. I do, I was invited too, but we shouldn't treat mom like this. It's despicable. We're a family, and we should support mom. That's your business, the man waved his hand. I'm leaving. A month has passed since then. Laura wandered around the house like a shadow, caressing her mother's belongings. A week had passed since Miranda's funeral, and Laura couldn't bring herself to rearrange or tidy up anything. Even the robe still hung on the back of the chair next to the bed. Her father hadn't been home that night, as usual. But Laura stayed with her mother, holding her hand until her very last breath. Miranda understood that the hour had come and asked her daughter to be with her in that moment. Are you scared, mom? Laura asked, swallowing her tears. No, my dear. Does it hurt? It's not scary, and it doesn't hurt. I've heard that pain subsides before death. And, you know, I feel good now, but I sense that it's time. My dear, please don't cry. Understand that in my case, it's not death, it's relief from suffering. I'm tired, and I can assure you, I want this myself. So you should be happy for me. By the way, there's an envelope with money in the bottom drawer of the dresser. 
It's for you. Your father doesn't know about it. Your grandmother left me something, and the rest I saved up when I was still working. Don't tell your father about it. Keep it for yourself, maybe for your wedding. I had them in a bank until recently, but I withdrew everything. Use them as you see fit. Mom, what wedding are you talking about? The girl sobbed. I don't even have a boyfriend. There will be, my dear, you'll have everything. You have your whole life ahead of you. One thing I do regret, Miranda smiled sadly, is that I won't celebrate your wedding or see my grandchildren. Laura remembered her last conversation with her mother, approached the dresser, and, pulling out the bottom drawer, searched inside with her hand. She immediately found the envelope and, opening her eyes wide in surprise, counted the money inside. There was a significant amount. She shook her head after quickly counting the bills. Mom, how did you manage to save up so much? The girl whispered to the silence. There's over a million here, and you always dreamed of going to the seaside, but you never fulfilled your dream. Thank you, Mommy. I will always remember and love you. You were the best woman in the world. She sat on the bed and burst into tears again. That's all she had been doing throughout the week after her mother's funeral, aimlessly wandering around the house and crying. She decided not to tell her father about the money. He had shown himself in a less than favorable light during her grandmother's and mother's illness. He didn't need these problems. He lived his own life, trying not to touch anything that could disturb his peace of mind. That morning, when her mother passed away, she held her hand for a long time, unable to move. She gazed at her mother's serene face and realized that it was all over. Then she called her father. Mom is gone, the girl said quietly into the phone. When? And after that short question, the girl heard a relieved exhale. Dad, at least pretend that you're sorry, she shouted into the phone. I can hear in your voice that you're happy, delighted. Daughter, what are you talking about? The man was flustered, calling Laura by that name for the first time. No, I, I'm definitely not happy, but we both understand that mom suffered. It's all over. Do you think she didn't want this herself? It's not for you to decide what she wanted or didn't want. You were supposed to be there with her in that moment. Where are you now? Come here, I don't know what to do. I'll come right now, Alex said and hung up the phone. The girl looked at the phone with hatred as she heard the short beeps. She was very angry at her father. That feeling didn't leave her during the funeral or now. Laura still spoke through gritted teeth whenever she talked to her father. Fortunately, it happened fairly rarely, but it should be noted that after mom's death, her father started showing up at home much more often. The girl wiped away the tears that welled up again and looked around. She needed to pull herself together and hide the money in a way that her father wouldn't accidentally discover them. Let them stay there, they'll come in handy, she thought. Despite going to bed quite late, Laura woke up earlier than her alarm the next morning. It was an important day, she had an interview to attend. After graduating from college, she hadn't been able to find a job because she wanted to spend more time with her mom, but after the funeral, she realized that work was her only chance to avoid falling into depression. She needed to find something urgently. After a brief search, she came across a job opening for a judge's secretary, which was perfect since she had a legal background. The interview went exceptionally well, and a couple of days later, they called her and invited her for her first day at work. At work, Laura found herself distracted from sad thoughts. There was a lot of work, but she enjoyed it. Leo, a young driver, noticed the perpetually sad Laura. She initially resisted his advances, but eventually gave in to his persistence. They started with a coffee date, then went to the movies, and after a month, they began seeing each other every evening. Leo lived with his mother in a small two-bedroom apartment. When he dropped Laura off at her home in his company car and saw her house, he let out a whistle of surprise. Wow. Do you live here all alone? Well, not exactly alone, Laura smiled. With my father, but he rarely shows up. Still, you have a very big house. It's spacious enough for three families. Leo couldn't help but admire. Yes, we used to have a big family, Laura sighed. 
My mom and grandmother were also here, but now it's just my father and me. But we don't communicate very well. From what you've told me, your dad didn't pay much attention to your mother when she was sick, right? Leo clarified. Well, saying he didn't pay attention is an understatement, Laura smirked. He practically disappeared from our lives. He wasn't even home most of the time. He had no interest in anything related to my mom. Well, I don't know, Laura. I'm not defending anyone, but have you ever considered that he was just going through his own internal struggles and didn't know what to do? Sometimes men behave strangely out of sheer helplessness. You mentioned before that doctors refused to operate on your mother. So what could he have done? Just be there, the girl whispered. Just be there for her. Leo and Laura had been dating for four months. It was October, and the evenings were getting cooler. One day, as Leo walked Laura home, he theatrically blew on his frozen, reddened hands and said. I'm so thirsty, I could spend the night somewhere. He laughed when he saw Laura's surprised expression. Laura, what I mean is, maybe you could invite me in for a cup of tea? Laura glanced briefly at her house, saw the lights in the windows, and shook her head in disagreement. No, Leo, another time. My dad is home. But that's what I'm talking about, the guy insisted. It's time for us to meet your father. Don't you think so? I introduced you to my mom a long time ago, and you're still hesitant. Or do you not believe in the seriousness of my intentions? I believe you, Leo, I do, but it's not the right time yet. Our relationship has just started to develop, and it's still very fragile. I'm not ready for that step yet. Fine, as you say. Well, let's agree that you won't postpone it indefinitely, the guy agreed, and after a brief pause, they said their goodbyes. As Laura rushed into the house, freezing to her fingertips, she began to take off her shoes and froze in place. For a moment, she thought she heard a woman's voice coming from inside the house. She listened carefully. It must have been my imagination, the girl decided. First, she headed to the shower, and when she emerged, a surprise awaited her. Laura, let me introduce you. This is Lisa. From today onwards, she will be living here with me, her father said, waiting for his daughter in the hallway. Standing next to him was a much younger woman, about 10 years older than Laura. It was clear that both of them were very nervous. And Laura, she was at a loss for words. Who is this? And what do you mean she'll be living here? And then it hit Laura. Her legs almost gave out from under her as she realized what her suspicion meant. Did you cheat on mom with her? Am I understanding correctly? Laura, your mother passed away, and I am alive. Am I not allowed to start new relationships anymore, in your opinion? What new relationships? Mom has been gone for only four months, you couldn't have possibly, the girl paused for a moment, then covered her mouth with her hand and took a step back. You couldn't have possibly, if you've been having this affair for a long time, even while mom was alive. Mom had an idea that you had someone. She mentioned it to me once, but I didn't believe her. I thought you were much better than that, and you. You're a scoundrel. You're a despicable traitor. I would ask you to choose your words carefully, after all, you're talking to your father. That's the point, you're my father, she persisted, an adult, and how old is she? She nodded disdainfully toward the new love interest of her father. Yes, she's just a little older than me. The girl shouted, directing her outburst solely at her father, ignoring the unpleasant woman. But Lisa, shifting from one foot to the other, decided to add her two cents. Well, actually, I'm 32. And tell me, what's the point of us going around renting apartments when your father has such a huge house? There's enough space for all of us here. Lisa, please be quiet, Alex quietly said to her. I'll handle everything with my daughter myself. Laura, but Lisa is right. I do remember that grandma left the house to you, but you must understand that I have much more rights to it. And, by the way, Lisa and I will take the larger bedroom. Is that supposed to be yours and mom's bedroom? Laura was tired of being surprised by this person's audacity. 
It used to be mine and mom's, until she got sick. But I want to remind you again that mom is no longer here. And now it's just a bedroom that shouldn't remain empty, and it will suit us perfectly. Lisa and I are getting married soon, and will probably have children. What's so terrible about that? Did you really think that after Miranda's death, I would bury myself alive? It's absurd. Laura walked into the living room, sat on the couch, and covered her head with her hands. Dad, couldn't you have at least waited for a year out of decency? This is disgusting. You had the audacity to come here. And why can't we live in this house? Lisa spoke up again. If we're going down that road, you obtained this house illegally. Your grandma was senile. I told Alex to challenge that damn will, but he didn't listen to me. Lisa, shut up. The man exclaimed. But it was too late. Laura jumped up from the couch as if stung. Oh, so you were talking about this. That means you've been together since grandma was still alive. I hate you, you disgusting traitor. She pushed her father out of her way and ran to her room, slamming the door loudly. Lisa, I asked you to be quiet, I would have handled it myself, the man grumbled. Oh, Alex, she'll calm down. Let's go have dinner instead, everything has already cooled down, I suppose. And Laura fell onto the bed in her room and burst into tears. How could this happen, she thought. He got involved with that disgusting Lisa even when mom didn't know about her illness. She was giving advice. What a scoundrel. Laura cried herself to sleep in the middle of the night and woke up earlier than usual. She quickly got ready for work and quietly left the house. She didn't want to see those people, but throughout the workday, she scolded herself for her morning weakness. On the contrary, she should have shown them that she was in charge. It was her own home, not that sly Lisa's, and she, Laura, was the one in control, not this Lisa. Ugh. What a disgusting name, the girl grimaced at the thought. After work, as always, Leo was waiting for her. Laura, let's go to my place. Mom promised to bake a pie with potatoes and mushrooms, your favorite. It's getting chilly to walk around the streets. I don't want to, Leo. Don't take offense, but I need to go home and show that disgusting Lisa who's truly in charge there. I'm not going to hide from her anymore. I'll walk through the rooms, watch TV in the living room, basically behave as usual. I already regret running away this morning, cowardly with my tail between my legs. I still can't recover from my father's behavior. Laura, what were you expecting? Leo was surprised. Your father is not an old man. He can't spend the rest of his life alone just because you decided so. I don't understand, whose side are you on, she glared angrily at him. I'm on your side, you can be sure of that, but I don't quite understand your father's guilt. Well, it's better if you stay silent then, or else we'll argue. The girl grumbled and walked ahead. Then she abruptly stopped, turned around 180 degrees, and found herself face to face with Leo. He nearly knocked her off her feet in surprise. Well, do you really think it's normal for a man to bury his wife, whom he lived with for 25 years and claimed to love, and bring a replacement into the house just four months later? Do you think every man would do that? And don't tell me it's the norm of life. There are, after all, basic rules of decency, and it's not for me to tell him about them if he still doesn't understand at his age. But I won't allow him to trample on my mother's memory. Seeing how angry his girlfriend was, Leo decided not to respond to avoid worsening the already difficult situation. He simply shrugged his shoulders and hugged her. Laura entered the house noisily, stomping loudly to make a show of it. She walked into the living room and carelessly tossed her bag onto the couch. But what she saw shocked her. In the middle of the room stood a huge box that was already half-filled with her mother's belongings and photographs while Lisa was attempting to remove her portrait from the wall. Hey, hands off my mom. Laura barked in a voice that wasn't her own, causing Lisa to startle and almost fall off the stool. Why are you scaring me like that, she snapped. She's no longer here, and we live here now. You'll have to accept that fact, Laura. The father rushed out of the bedroom at the noise and immediately understood what had happened. 
Laura, but admit it, Lisa is right. Look around, mom's things are everywhere, and it's not right. Even according to the rules, you're supposed to get rid of a deceased person's belongings, otherwise, they won't find peace up there, he raised a pointing finger upward. Do you want mom to suffer there? That's first. And second, Lisa is a new member of our family, and it upsets her to see all this. If someone is uncomfortable in my house, they're free to leave. But my mother's things will stay in their place. Lay a finger on them, she glared angrily at her father's passion, and I'll rip your hands off. You heard me loud and clear. Don't touch anything here. Alex saw that his daughter was furious and decided not to argue. While she was in such a state, asserting authority would be useless, as Laura was on the verge of getting into a fight. Fine, fine, Laura. As you say, her father's tone became more conciliatory. We'll leave the portrait of mom in place, but as for these belongings. Nothing, Laura stubbornly repeated. I already said, everything here will remain as it was when mom was alive. Nonsense. Lisa shrugged petulantly. You two can figure it out, but personally, I don't want to live amidst a dead woman's photographs. And she left the room, proudly straightening her shoulders and lifting her nose. Laura barely suppressed the urge to throw something heavy at her back. Meanwhile, Alex chased after Lisa, and Laura was left alone in the living room. She approached the box and took out the photographs. There it was, her favorite one. They were all in it, mom, dad, and little Laura with her arms outstretched, pretending to be an airplane while sitting on her father's lap. And they were all smiling. Weren't they a happy family? Why did everything turn out like this? The girl wiped away a tear that had welled up and began to take out the rest of the belongings. I won't allow it, mommy, do you hear me? I won't allow the memories of you to be erased. You'll always be with me. Two months later, Alex and Lisa formalized their relationship. It had only been half a year since Miranda's death. Alex didn't hesitate to rent a restaurant and invite all his friends there. Laura flatly refused to attend the wedding. During these two months of living together, Laura and Lisa managed to communicate, more or less, despite the circumstances. Living under the same roof, the girls were simply forced to do so. In the morning, Leo came to Laura's place, and she was surprised to see him dressed in a suit when she opened the door. Where are you going? She looked at him suspiciously. Nowhere, he stammered. I just thought that if you happen to change your mind and accept your father's invitation, then I'll be ready. You know, just being prepared. In vain, Laura smiled. It's only been half a year since mom passed away, it's indecent. He's shameless, but I'm not. Laura, you know they were supposed to get married, otherwise. The guy hesitated and stared at the floor, shifting from one foot to the other. You know something, she looked at him suspiciously again. Come on, spill it. All right, he nodded excitedly. About a week ago, while I was waiting for you, your father and Lisa were having tea in the kitchen. Well, he told me that Lisa is pregnant. But they don't know how to tell you, so they asked me. They were both afraid of your reaction. Pregnant? Laura exclaimed. Yes, when he's almost 50. What kind of children are they talking about? But Lisa is 32. Naturally, she wants children. In her anger, Laura, who was washing the dishes left from dinner, carelessly threw the sponge into the sink. He wants a family? And what were my mom and I to him? Now they're going to have a baby and enjoy life here, in the house where my mom suffered not long ago. Where is justice in this world, huh? Leo, seeing that Laura was upset, cautiously suggested. Laura, maybe we can go to my mom's place or to a cafe. Did I dress up for nothing? Can I stay at your place overnight? Laura unexpectedly asked. Leo nodded. I don't want to witness their happiness in the evening. And also, she paused for a moment, as if contemplating something, then said, Leo, would you consider moving in with me here, to this house? We could start living together. Thank God, exclaimed the delighted guy. So, you agree to marry me? Not exactly, Laura corrected him cautiously. 
let's just live together for now, get to know each other. Dating is one thing, but living together is something else entirely. At least for a year. Don't you know how many divorces happen because of rushed marriages like this? Let's not repeat other people's mistakes. Wait, Leo frowned. Do you want to live with me or just annoy your father and Lisa? Don't complicate things, Laura waved him off. I want to live with you. And let's leave it at that. I'm going to get dressed, and they can wash their own dishes. And she walked into the bedroom. Laura didn't return home until the evening of the following day. She and Leo started the moving process. After packing up all of Leo's belongings, he decided to take his computer desk with him because it was brand new, and they arranged for a moving truck. A satisfied Leo and Laura arrived at the house in the evening. The girl entered first and came face to face with her father and his new spouse in the living room. Dad, I want to share some joyful news with you, at least for me, she said. I'm going to live with Leo. He's moving in here. What's going on here? She trailed off, surveying the room carefully. Where, where is mom's portrait? Where is her favorite armchair? Alex stretched his whole body, his eyes darting anxiously. It was clear he didn't know how to respond to his daughter. His wife wanted to answer for him and had already opened her mouth, but the girl shot out of the living room like a bullet. Opening the closet in her mother's bedroom, she couldn't hold back her tears. The shelves were empty, and the bed, the one on which Miranda passed away, was also missing. Where did you put mom's things? Laura hissed through her teeth. We took them away, where else? Lisa gloated. They were sent to a social center. They help families in need. The items are all in good condition, so let them serve society instead of just gathering dust in a closet. Your mother would have been happy with this decision. I'm sure. Who do you think you are to make any decisions here? I warned you, now deal with the consequences yourselves. Calm down, Lisa barked. Alex and I are a family now. I don't know if you're aware, but we're soon going to have a baby. I don't want to raise a child in this mausoleum where every item reminds me of your deceased mother. Life must go on. Her life ended, but ours continues. Laura stared at Lisa wide-eyed, unable to utter a word in her outrage. Alex came to the rescue. Laura, but Lisa is right in a way, but we can't do it like this. Of course, we can't, his wife agreed, seeing that Laura was silent. This is our home too. Your home, the girl exploded. Did I miss here? This is my home, and mine alone. I had already come to terms with you moving in here, with you deciding to have a baby. The only thing I asked of you as human beings was not to touch anything that once belonged to my mom. And what happened in the end? Where is her portrait, her armchair, and all her photos? Laura, don't worry so much. The pictures are here, Alex chirped, opening the bottom drawer of the dresser. He realized the situation was extremely heated. We put everything in here, and the portrait is still hanging on the wall. What did you think? That we threw them away? And he nervously laughed. What's all the noise? No fight, huh? Leo asked, smiling, as he entered the living room burdened with two bags. But when he saw the expressions on everyone's faces, the smile vanished. Alex, are you against me living here? Are you arguing because of this? And here I am, ready to unload my things. Unload, Laura replied in a cold tone instead of her father. But don't let go of the car. It will still be needed for one more move today. Seeing the surprised looks of those present, she explained, Dad and his new wife are moving out from here. What do you mean? Lisa didn't understand. But Alex understood everything and decided to act differently. He approached his daughter, embraced her by the shoulders, and said. Sweetheart, don't lose your temper. You're a grown-up girl and should understand that this is also my home. You can't just kick us out of here like that. Why can't I? Laura smirked. Oh, I certainly can. Grandma left the house to me. I'm the sole owner. Have you ever wondered why she did it this way? 
Maybe she knew your rotten soul? She saw through you. And now I understand her. The girl wanted to scream in frustration, but she held herself together and stubbornly declared. Leave. This is my final decision. You no longer live here. You have no right, Lisa squealed. Alex, tell her. I do. It's the law, my dear. And if you don't leave voluntarily, I will have to call the police. Laura, come on, let's all calm down, go to sleep, and discuss everything with a clear head tomorrow. But where do we go tonight? Alex asked. I don't care. You didn't worry about my well-being when you got rid of mom's things, even though you knew how I felt about it. So why should I worry about you? And, by the way, I'm calm. I won't change my decision tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, or even in a year. Let's get it over with already. It was pouring outside, as if someone had dumped a bucket of water. As Alex descended into the subway, the rain was just starting to drizzle, but by the time he arrived at his station and emerged to the surface, he was slightly taken aback, wondering how he would make it home. He didn't have an umbrella with him, and waiting it out didn't seem like a viable option because it was clear that the rain would last a long time. So, he resigned himself to getting soaked. Alex briskly walked down the street towards his apartment, muttering curses under his breath directed at the car that didn't start that morning, at Lisa, and at life in general. The walk from the subway station to their rented apartment took five minutes at a fast pace, and during that time, Alex got completely drenched. As he rushed into the courtyard of the nine-story building, he glanced irritably at his crossover parked in the parking lot. Of course, the car required maintenance and investments. Alex had always been proud of his vehicle and had long realized that the starter needed to be replaced. The inevitable happened. The car refused to start in the morning. He rushed into the entrance, leaving puddles behind him, and made his way to the elevator. Unpleasant squelching sounds echoed from one of his shoes. Upon entering the apartment, Alex kicked off his shoes and tossed them aside. Lisa, he shouted from the doorway. I urgently need new shoes. The sole came off. Tomorrow, before work, I'll stop by the store, so please don't count on the remains of my paycheck. With these words, he walked into the only room of the apartment they rented. The room was quite spacious, but it served as both their bedroom and a place to spend leisure time. And soon, they would have a baby. His wife was lying on the bed, placing her hands on her huge belly, watching TV. Upon hearing her husband's words, she clumsily sat up and responded indignantly. What do you mean, don't count on the remains of my paycheck? You still have 30,000 left. Are you planning to buy golden shoes? Well, I'm not going to the market, and I'm not going to wear cheap shoes. Plus, I need money for the car. I have to buy a new starter. I can't rely on the subway for transportation," Alex replied. Everyone drives, it's no big deal. She muttered. And she raised her voice, how much longer can we talk about your car? You drive such an expensive car while we live in a rented apartment. I've been asking, it needs to be sold, and then we'll have a down payment for a mortgage. We can buy ourselves a proper apartment, and most importantly, our own. Oh God, you're driving me crazy with these talks. Alex shouted. I've told you a hundred times, I'm not selling my car. I have a home. Laura is impulsive, but forgiving. I'll visit her again soon. What's the point? She won't let us in anymore. She even kicked you out, what are you still talking about? And besides, I don't want to live in a house where someone else is in charge. Alex, we're going to have a baby, and we should have our own place, and you have to let go of this house. It will never be yours again. And you know what I'll tell you, Alex burst out. If you want your own place, buy it. But don't even think about my car. Did you prepare dinner? Lisa struggled to get up from the bed, holding her lower back and emphasizing her large belly. Alex, you didn't even ask how I've been feeling today. Pregnancy is not an illness, the man frowned. I understand from your words that dinner is not ready again. What kind of woman are you? My ex always managed everything, even when she was sick. 
Stop bringing up your ex again, the woman shrieked. I don't want to hear about her anymore. She was so great, and yet you moved on to me from her? Yes, I didn't love her, but when it came to household matters, Miranda was great, unlike you. Oh really? Lisa exclaimed. So, you want a capable wife, but what about yourself? Take a look at yourself. You're supposed to provide me with everything I need, but look at what I have. We're about to have a baby, no crib, no stroller, and we're living in a one-room rental. But you're driving around in an expensive car and planning to buy yourself genuine leather shoes. I can see that you're not used to denying yourself anything. Think about that. Oh, go to hell. Alex angrily exclaimed, then swiftly turned around and headed to the bathroom, taking off his wet clothes along the way. He was so fed up with these fights with Lisa. She wasn't like this before when he was just seeing her while still married. She used to be gentle and sweet, but now she had turned into a nagging, perpetually dissatisfied person who constantly demanded things from him. Yes, he wouldn't sell his car, no matter how much she whined. A real man should have a nice car to emphasize his status. Miranda, on the other hand. She never asked for anything. Now Alex could clearly see all the benefits of life with her. It's a shame she got sick, otherwise, they would still be together. There could have been many women like Lisa for him, but he hadn't planned to leave Miranda at first until she fell ill. The comfortable life with his wife suited Alex just fine, and he expected the same from Lisa, but she turned out to be completely different in character. She only thinks about herself and takes care of herself, lying in bed all day long. Alex boiled with anger as he filled the bathtub with hot water and undressed. But when he sank into it, trying to relax, it didn't work. This bathtub with its limescale buildup, the crack-tiled wall, everything here felt alien to him. He longed to be home. Laura. Damn it. The man still couldn't believe that his daughter could treat him like this, throwing him out of his own house like a misbehaving cat. Alex had thoughts of contesting the will, but too much time had passed since it took effect, and besides, his daughter worked as an assistant to a judge and surely had the necessary connections. He knew the case would be a losing battle, but continuing to live like this had also become unbearable. Unlike Miranda, Lisa constantly nagged him, demanding money without earning anything herself, while Alex had his own needs, clothes, a car, gasoline. Furthermore, he was the one paying for this apartment, and now a baby was about to be born. Alex already regretted agreeing to Lisa's pregnancy. At the time, everything seemed like it would be different. He wanted a male heir. Having only one daughter, Alex desired a son. That, in principle, was about to come true. On the ultrasound, his wife was clearly told that she would have a boy, but given the recent events and domestic difficulties, this news no longer pleased Alex. The man lay there, covering his eyes, while the water in the bathtub began to cool. He needed to get out and prepare something for himself. His stomach was growling as if it was devouring itself, and then a hysterical scream from Lisa echoed through the room. Alex, Alex, come here quickly. Help me, it's urgent. Alex cursed as he stepped out of the bath, hastily drying himself with a bath towel. Then he wrapped the towel around his hips and went into the room. Lisa was lying on the bed, curling her legs up to her chest, holding her stomach. She was screaming incessantly. Darling, it hurts. I think labor is starting. Call an ambulance quickly. His wife's shrill falsetto pierced his ears. Alex frowned. What labor, Lisa? It's still too early. Just hold on a bit, maybe it will pass. No, I'm telling you something is wrong. Call the ambulance right away, she shouted. Yeah. Okay, I'll call now, muttered Alex, annoyed, as he walked reluctantly to the hallway where he had left his phone on the side table. His irritation was growing. The ambulance would arrive soon, which meant he had to get dressed. Once again, he would be left hungry, and he really wanted to eat something warm and stretch out on the couch. How fed up he was with Lisa and this whole life. Meanwhile, Laura and Leo happily emerged from a beautiful building, with the words, Registry Office prominently displayed on the door. 
They had just submitted their application for marriage registration, and in a month, they would become husband and wife. Leo was more excited than the girl. He had long insisted on formalizing their relationship because Laura was already content with everything. Now, however, she succumbed to her boyfriend's joyous mood, laughing and behaving like a schoolgirl. Perhaps Leo was right in insisting on marriage. After all, they had been living together for a long time, and now they would officially become a family. Family. Laura had missed that so much. After she kicked her father and his wife out of the house, he had tried several times to talk to her, to persuade her, the man really wanted to come back home. However, Laura remained resolute. The resentment towards her father had been building up in Laura like a snowball, ever since her mother's time when she witnessed his indifference. Bringing Lisa into the house four months after his wife's death only added fuel to the fire burning in her heart, and the final drop fell when they got rid of her mother's belongings. Since then, Laura had harbored almost hatred towards her father, and she could admit it to herself. It was unpleasant for her to see Alex, to talk to him. Behind his friendliness, she saw hypocrisy and selfishness. Laura's smile faded as soon as she thought about her father, and Leo immediately stopped, holding his future wife's hand. What's wrong, she turned around. Look, the guy gestured with his eyes towards a glass showcase, behind which delectable pastries were on display. Eclairs, your favorites. They have tables here. We can also get coffee from the vending machine. Let's go in and celebrate submitting the application. Sure, Laura smiled again, pushing all thoughts of her father out of her mind. The eclairs turned out to be fluffy and delicious. As Laura devoured them, smearing cream all over her face, Leo gently wiped it off with a napkin. One of the saleswomen admired them, nudging the other with her elbow. Look, youth and love. Oh, where are my 17 years? Yeah, they must be older than 17, for sure. Well, what's the difference? Love is love, sighed the saleswoman. Meanwhile, Leo returned to the question that had been bothering him. Laura, we still haven't decided how we'll celebrate our wedding. A restaurant is expensive. I've already told you, Leo, my mom left me money for the wedding. I can pay for the restaurant. But you know, I've been thinking, I don't have many relatives. With my college friends, we can just go to a cafe. Maybe we won't go all out, just sign the papers and use my mom's money for a honeymoon trip. The guy caught his breath. Are you saying that your mom left you so much that we can afford a trip abroad? We have enough, Laura laughed. I know that's what my mom wanted. She dreamed of traveling her whole life, but it didn't happen, she didn't have the chance. She would be happy for me and wouldn't mind her savings being used this way. Leo stared at the radiant Laura, his eyes widening, and carefully choosing his words, he said persuasively. Laura, I understand that it's not my business and not my money, but soon we'll be husband and wife, and maybe you can tell me the exact amount you have? Why not? My mom left me a million, the girl casually stated. Wow, the guy whistled. And you want to spend such a huge sum on a trip? Just a trip. Well, first of all, not just a trip, but a honeymoon. And secondly, not all the money will be spent, something will be left. But still, it's a tremendous amount, and if it's not squandered, it can be used more rationally. For example? Laura smiled. Well, I don't even know. I don't even know how to say it, Leo hesitated and decided to start from a distance. Look, Laura, while we're walking on foot, so to speak, cobblers without shoes. Since I turned 18, I've dreamed of having a car, but as you've noticed, my mom is not wealthy, and I can't really afford one on my salary. But imagine, if we buy a car with this money. We can use it to go to work and back, take evening rides around the city, go wherever we want. Yes, even to the neighboring town. It won't be a problem. And for shopping as well. Just imagine how our lives would change, you and me. Seeing the surprise in Laura's eyes, Leo hurried to add. No, of course, the car will be registered in your name. It's your money, I understand that. 
She carefully placed the half-empty paper cup of coffee on the table and looked at her future husband, bewildered. I don't know, Leo. I've never thought about it. You know, I don't even have a driver's license, and I've never even had the desire to get one. And if we buy a car, we won't have money for the wedding or the trip. Let it be. We can celebrate modestly in a cafe, just as you suggested. And we still have a whole life ahead of us for traveling. We'll have time, he passionately convinced her. Well, okay, I'll think about it, replied Laura, but Leo could already see that she was starting to hesitate, and he knew he could persuade her. Leaving the bakery, she dragged him to the park. She wanted to take a walk in the fresh air, but he had already lost his enthusiasm and wasn't really listening to what his girlfriend was saying. Leo immersed himself in thoughts about the car. Eventually, the couple decided to head home, stopping by the grocery store on the way to buy something for dinner. They settled on chicken. Laura decided to roast it whole in the oven, and that's what she started doing when they returned home. Leo didn't help, even though he accompanied her to the kitchen. He took out his phone and started browsing car sale ads. Laura, look at this. It's fantastic, isn't it? And imagine, it's within our budget. Although the price seems too low. Yes, that's suspicious, maybe it's damaged, Leo said, showing her the listing. Laura frowned, Leo, I haven't even given my consent to buy a car yet. I said I would think about it. Yeah, think, think, he waved it off. I'm just dreaming here. Can't I dream? He flashed a smile at Laura. Dream away, she sighed, but a few minutes later, she was infected by the guy's enthusiasm and sat down next to him, resting her head on his shoulder. She started looking at cars too. Yeah, why not, thought Laura. A car is an investment, and we can always sell it later. Look how excited Leo is. It seems like he really has been dreaming about it for a long time. Well, my salary is pretty good for our town, and why should the money just sit there? Leo, why are you only looking at used cars? Can't we afford a new one? To be honest, only a domestic one. But I'd love to have an import, Leo replied. Suddenly, his phone vibrated and came to life in his hands. Laura, sitting beside him, saw that it was her father calling Leo. She quickly lifted her head from his shoulder. What's this? Why is he calling you? Do you two communicate? Well, he called a couple of times, asking about your mood, Leo explained. Answer it and put it on speaker, Laura nodded towards the phone. Leo did as she said. Hello, Leo. I haven't been calling Laura because she won't pick up anyway. I'm near the gate, can you come out to me? Reluctantly, Laura went to her father with Leo, even though she didn't want to see Alex. She was very curious why he had come again. The man stood by the gate, nervously finishing his cigarette. Seeing his daughter approaching, he seemed even more agitated, as his fingers holding the cigarette began to tremble. Hello, Laura. It's good that you came out together. I can't go home, you took my keys, Alex said with a hint of pressure. Why did you come, the girl asked forcefully. What do you want again? I want to go back home, alone, Alex blurted out. He threw away the cigarette and began angrily tapping its tip with his shoe. Laura absent-mindedly glanced at his feet and noticed that the sole of his shoe was coming off. Well, look at my fashionable dad in shabby shoes, a sarcastic thought passed through the girl's mind. First of all, this is no longer your home, and you can't come back here. I'm tired of explaining this to you. At the same time, I'm curious why you're alone. Where is Lisa? Before Alex could extinguish one cigarette, he started pulling out a new one from the pack. Then he took a long time to light it, carefully choosing his words. Lisa is in the maternity hospital. By the way, you have a new brother now. But that's not important anymore. I only realized now, understood that they can't be my family. You see, I don't want to live with them. My family is you, and it used to be your mother. Shut up. Laura erupted, her calm facade shattered. Not a word about my mother. It feels like we were never a family to you. 
not even your own mother, my grandmother. You didn't want to take care of her, didn't pay attention. It's like you were happy when she was gone. And my mother. I've thought so much about what we did wrong. If only you had helped her more with grandma, helped with the house, maybe she would have had time to go to the hospital earlier, and she would be alive now. Did you never think about that? No, of course not. Why would you? You always think only about yourself. Now you have a son, and you're planning to leave them. Do you even realize how disgusting you look from the outside? Do you seriously expect me to let you into this house? For the thousandth time, leave and never come back. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Leo, let's go home, Laura dragged the boy away by his sleeve, who hadn't participated in the conversation. Alex stood there, staring stubbornly at the closed gate, oblivious to the burn the cigarette but had left on his fingers. What an unpleasant girl. She resembles Miranda and doesn't resemble her at the same time. Miranda never had such a disgusting character. The man flicked away the filter, leaving a burn on his fingers, and walked away with the gait of a beaten dog. He could still go back to his rented apartment. Lisa wasn't there anyway, and tomorrow morning he would focus on repairing his car. Once the car was fixed, he would pack his things and leave. Alex didn't tell his daughter the whole truth, only a part of it. He did have a son, but it was uncertain how long the child would live. Amidst the scandals, premature labor began for Lisa, but the man believed she was to blame. What's the point of hysterics anyway? When the ambulance took his wife, Alex didn't go with them. Why would I go there, he replied to the paramedic's question. They won't let me in to give birth with her. She'll call me herself. Lisa called after a day. She was crying so much on the phone that initially, he couldn't make out what she was saying. So, did you give birth? A boy. Well, why are you crying? Alex, the woman wailed into the phone. Come, talk to the doctor. I don't understand anything he's explaining to me. Something seems to be wrong with our son. They didn't even show him to me, they immediately took him to the intensive care unit. Please come, Alex. I'll be there soon. He hung up the phone and, cursing his wife with every breath, called a taxi. What a fool Lisa is. She just can't understand. What could possibly be wrong with the boy? They probably took him away because he's premature. And this fool is crying again. Alex tried to console himself with such thoughts, but he was still worried. After the conversation with the chief physician of the maternity ward, Alex's worry turned into horror, sheer panic. He stumbled out of the doctor's office, as if drunk, and without even remembering about Lisa waiting for him, he headed towards the elevator. He quickly walked out of the hospital gates and started walking down the street, not knowing where he was going. Fragments of phrases spoken by the chief physician kept popping up in his mind. The boy was born with a severe heart defect. He needs an urgent operation. It's uncertain how long the child will live without it. Such operations are done in Germany. Do you have the money? Operation, illness, money. Alex leaned against the hospital's iron fence and grabbed his head with his hands paying no attention to the bewildered looks from passers-by. How familiar all of this was. And how tired he was of it. First his mother, then Miranda, and now even a child. What kind of curse was on him that he was surrounded by sick people? And why, oh why, was he the one who had to solve everything? It was easier with Miranda. She didn't ask for anything and quietly died before his eyes, looking at him with a loyal, dog-like gaze. But Lisa was different. She would demand that he solve everything. But he wasn't almighty. Where would he get the money for treatment in Germany? And even if he had such money, was it worth spending it on a knowingly sick child? It was uncertain if the operation would help him, and why should he be the one to deal with it? After all, he hated illnesses and everything associated with them. Lisa was to blame herself for giving birth to a sick boy, and Alex was already finding it difficult to live with her. Yes, that's right, he had considered leaving her. So why not do it now? He didn't need these problems. 
He couldn't handle it, didn't want to. Alex smirked. Let them all think of me as a scoundrel, although who are they all? Only Lisa, but I don't care about her opinion, and Laura won't find out about the child's illness. Remembering his daughter, the man realized where he needed to go. He broke away from the fence and headed towards the bus stop, deciding to try to go back home once again. His expensive coat's pocket kept ringing with his phone. There was no need for him to take it out, he already knew who was calling him. Sure, Lisa. She's worried, going crazy, but he doesn't want to know anything anymore. Lisa called her husband again and again in vain, he didn't answer the phone. Either his phone ran out of battery or he turned it off. Her head was spinning. Gathering courage, she got up from the hospital bed and staggered towards the chief doctor's office to talk to her personally. I just explained everything to your husband. He left my office about 15 minutes ago. Haven't you seen each other? The elderly woman doctor asked, surprised. What did you explain to my husband? I didn't understand anything. Please tell me again. Why is my son in the intensive care unit? The chief doctor described the situation once again, using clear and concise words that made Lisa want to scream, but she held herself together. So that's it. Money is needed for my son to survive. And you told my husband everything. I understand, he went to look for the money. But what should I do? Well, what can you do, the doctor shrugged. If you feel okay, we'll discharge you in three days. Without my child, Lisa noted the unspoken question immediately. The boy will stay in the ICU. He's hooked up to a machine. Let's hope the issue with the surgery gets resolved quickly because we don't know how long the baby can hold on without it. Lisa desperately wanted to believe that her husband was searching for the money and struggling to find a solution. But he didn't contact her for three days. And when she was discharged from the hospital and returned to their apartment, she didn't find her husband or his belongings there. On that day, Laura was at work but couldn't concentrate at all. She was constantly distracted by her beeping phone, receiving photos of cars. Leo was sending them incessantly. Doesn't he have any work to do? Laura irritably thought. He doesn't do anything himself and distracts me. He's gone crazy with that car of his. He can't make up his mind, and it's driving me crazy. The landline phone on her desk rang piercingly. Laura flinched, realizing that she had forgotten to lower the volume once again. It was the security guard sitting on the first floor at the entrance of the courthouse who was calling. Laura, there's a persistent girl asking for you here. Could you come down? Puzzled about who it could be, Laura descended to the first floor and was very surprised to see the visitor. She was surprised not just because Lisa had come to her, but by how she looked. Lisa had no trace of makeup, her hair was messy and tied back, and she had lost a significant amount of weight since the last time Laura had seen her. Is your father living with you? She attacked without greeting. Let's go outside, Laura suggested, not wanting to sort things out in front of the guard, who immediately perked up his ears. They stepped out onto the high porch of the courthouse. What happened to you, and why did you come to me to look for your husband? Well, doesn't he live with you? I thought he did. Where else would he go? He left us as soon as he found out that his son was born with a heart defect. He abandoned us. With what defect? Laura involuntarily asked for clarification. He didn't tell me anything about that. Yes, he came begging to come back home, saying that he had a son. And, of course, I didn't let him in. But he didn't mention anything about the child's illness. He just ran away, ran away, Lisa hysterically exclaimed. I came back from the maternity ward, and the apartment was empty. His things are gone. So, you were discharged from the hospital? And who did you leave the child with? Don't you listen to me at all? My son is sick. He's in the ICU, hooked up to a machine. He urgently needs an operation that costs a fortune. The only place where they can perform this operation is in Germany. As soon as Alex found out about all this, he vanished, Lisa wrung her hands. Laura was in shock. What a scoundrel! 
What a despicable person, she whispered. How can someone behave like this? First, his grandmother, then his mother, and now his own son. And you too. Where were you looking when a man came to you from a dying wife? How can he be normal? Can you rely on someone like that? You're not far off yourself, having an affair with a married man. Well, I didn't know at first that he was married. I found out when I was already deeply involved in the relationship. And even then, he kept telling me that they were living poorly and would be getting a divorce soon. And I only found out about your mother's illness shortly before her death. It's true, Laura. I knew Alex was unscrupulous, but to this extent. It's his son and your brother, after all. By the way, can you hear that? Brother. Lisa fervently grabbed Laura's forearm. Laura, they will allow me to visit him today. Come with me, let's go see your little brother. Why? Laura pushed her away. She felt so cold, having stepped outside in just a blouse, yet for some reason, she couldn't turn around and walk away from this almost deranged woman. Why should I go there, she asked again, not hearing an answer. Well, what if he doesn't make it? You'll never get to see your little brother. How can you say that? How can you? Lisa pleaded. Find the money. There are charitable foundations. Reach out to them. I already did, but it takes time. And unfortunately, my son doesn't have that time. Laura, at least look at his photos. It's hard to see from here, they don't let me get close. But look, look at how handsome my boy is. Lisa anxiously scrolled through the photos on her phone. All right, enough with the hysterics, Laura said sternly. You shouldn't behave like this now. You need to pull yourself together, seek funding, save your son, and don't rely on the father. He won't help you. He has always been like this. It's a shame our mother didn't see it sooner. But you should have known when you married him. Laura returned to her desk at work, but she couldn't focus. Her heart felt heavy, disgusted by their father's actions, and burdened by thoughts of the child. Lisa didn't calm down and started sending Laura more photos of the boy. Laura opened one of them and zoomed in. It was hard to see clearly, but the baby was surrounded by wires and tubes, lying behind glass. Such a tiny face. And he didn't resemble his father at all. Ah. Uh. Maybe he looked like their grandmother? Yes, exactly. The shape of his nose was just like their grandmother's. Laura's heart tightened. Maybe she shouldn't have refused to go to the hospital with Lisa? So what if their father was a scoundrel and Lisa was a despicable person? The child was innocent. And he was, in fact, her brother. Her phone screen blinked in her hands, indicating a new message from Leo. It was a photo of a car with the caption. Finally, I found it. We'll take this car. Child or car. Laura shifted her gaze from one photo to another. She hadn't asked Lisa how much money was needed for the surgery, but a million was no small sum. So, was her little brother's life worth the price of a car? No, no. Laura shook her head, trying to shake off these dark thoughts. I shouldn't be thinking about this. It's not my problem, after all. And those funds belong to mom. Besides, would she have wanted to give them for a child born out of betrayal? The workday came to an end, and Leo and Laura took the bus home. Throughout the journey, Leo raved about the advantages of having a personal car, how they would stylishly travel home after the purchase, without having to sit and stare at the TV in the evening or walk through rainy streets. They would be able to afford to explore the whole city. But Laura wasn't listening to her fiancé. She was so tired of this constant chatter about the car. The girl remained pensive throughout the evening, responding vaguely or not at all. When Leo asked about the reason for her mood, Laura briefly outlined the situation. Well, that's news. Well, your father, of course, is something. Leo exclaimed. But what does it have to do with you? Why are you getting so involved? Is it your problem? It's only Lisa's problem now. You should have used your head. 
Laura herself understood that it was only Lisa's problem, but the worry didn't leave her until she lay in bed and drifted into an anxious sleep. In her dream, her mother came to her, beautiful, young, wearing her favorite dress. They walked together along the river bank, throwing pebbles into the calm water. Miranda was initially very cheerful, but suddenly she became serious, leaned in close to her daughter's face, and looked into her eyes. My dear, why do you think so poorly of me? What? Laura was bewildered. Mom, where did you get that idea? You think very poorly of me, Miranda shook her head. You know me better than anyone in the world, so why, why? The woman almost screamed. Laura jerked in bed and woke up. Cold sweat formed on her forehead. The dream had imprinted itself so vividly in her memory, and she instantly understood what her mother had reproached her for. Yes, of course, mom would have given the money for the boy's treatment without hesitation. How could Laura have thought such things about her mother? A gentle breeze blew through the partially open window of the car, tousling Leo's hair. He was cruising through the city, casually holding the steering wheel with one hand, while catching envious glances from weary people waiting at bus stops. Leo was so happy that he involuntarily smiled. And then a person in a traffic police uniform dashed onto the road, waving a baton towards Leo's car and blew a sharp whistle. Veering to the side of the road, Leo stopped, but the traffic officer continued with his unpleasant whistle. The sound pierced Leo's brain, irritating him, and as he jerked in bed, he fully woke up. What was a whistle in his dream turned out to be the piercing sound of his alarm clock. He squeezed his eyes shut, wishing to return to his wonderful dream and prolong those pleasant moments, but the ringing alarm clock didn't allow it. Laura, will you please turn it off already? Laura. But she didn't respond. The girl wasn't in bed next to him or in the room. Damn, did she go deaf or something? Leo thought, assuming Laura was in the kitchen preparing breakfast. He had to get up himself. Leo turned off the annoying alarm clock and stretched contentedly. What a fantastic dream he had. But no worries, soon that dream would become a reality. Leo decided to go to the bathroom first before heading to the kitchen to find Laura. But the silence in the house made him uneasy, and quickly walking through the rooms in search of his girlfriend, he realized he was home alone. It was very strange. Where could she have gone so early? Leo didn't have time to draw any conclusions because the culprit of his musings burst into the house. Laura burst in like a whirlwind, blushing from the morning frost, but happy. Leo, are you already up? I haven't slept since midnight, can you imagine? I dreamt of my mom, and I realized what I should do right. I wanted to wait until morning, but I couldn't. I called a taxi and went to Lisa's in the middle of the night. To Lisa's? Why did you go to Lisa's? Leo was surprised. You were supposed to have a feud with her. What did you need from her in the middle of the night? I gave her all my money for her brother's treatment. I think it's the right thing to do. It should be this way. I don't understand, Leo blinked. What money of yours? He fell silent abruptly as the meaning of her words started to sink in, and he looked at Laura with a heavy gaze she had never seen from her boyfriend before. Laura, tell me you couldn't have given away the money we were going to use to buy a car. Tell me that. Well, I don't have any other money, Laura shrugged carelessly. Yes, you understood correctly. I gave away that money. Leo, looking at her with a cruel glance she didn't recognize, took a step towards her. You couldn't do that. Are you completely stupid? You gave away that much money for the treatment of a complete stranger to a woman who hates you. What about our dream? What about the car, Laura? For the first time, he spoke to her so harshly, and his gaze made Laura uncomfortable. The joyful mood with which she had burst into the house evaporated instantly. And everything was going so well. Lisa, too, couldn't understand anything at first when Laura called her in the middle of the night, asking for her current address. When Laura arrived and placed the money, secured with a simple rubber band, in front of Lisa, Lisa stared at her in the same bewildered manner as her future husband did moments ago. What's this? Where did this money come from? The woman blinked with swollen eyes. 
Laura explained, but Lisa couldn't believe it and couldn't bring herself to believe it. Then she lunged at Laura, embracing her tightly and crying. Laura, you're incredible. Forgive me for everything. I caused you so much distress, and you. Lisa sobbed involuntarily too. You yourself told me that this boy is your brother, and I know mom wouldn't mind. I feel so guilty towards your mother, and now I understand it. I'll be grateful to you for the rest of my life. Now I have a real chance, a real chance to save my boy. They called me from a charity organization tonight and said that part of the amount has been raised. And now, with your money, the trip can become a reality. Lisa, still holding Laura tightly, pulled away and looked into her eyes. Laura, come with me to Germany. I beg you. I'm alone, completely alone. I'm so scared. I have no one, but you, you're now my closest and dearest person in the world. Let's go, I'm begging you." Laura agreed without hesitation. She also wanted to be by her little brother's side during this difficult period of his life. They sat together with Lisa until morning, discussing the upcoming trip and choosing a name for the boy. Laura suggested naming him George in honor of her grandfather. Lisa nodded in agreement. Yes, yes, let him be named after a good person. Your grandfather was a good man. I like the name. Now my son is not just an unnamed boy in intensive care, he's George. And he's waiting for us there, with you. And after such a night, Laura returned home in high spirits, but there was Leo, finally realizing the extent of his girlfriend's actions, and he started yelling profanities. You fool. You will immediately go to Lisa and take our money back from her. Tell her you've changed your mind. What do you mean? If you don't want to, then I'll go to her right now. Quickly, tell me the address. No, you won't go anywhere, Laura firmly stated. This is my decision, and I won't change it. A car is just a machine, and it's not worth the life of a child. We'll earn it ourselves later. When will we earn it ourselves? Leo continued yelling. How long will it take us to save up for it with our salaries, when we had the necessary amount in our hands? I've been dreaming about this car. I've already picked it out. That's the thing, it's you. And I never dreamed of it, and in the end, I didn't give you an answer, I didn't promise anything. I just said I would think about it. Take the money from Lisa, you fool. Leo shrieked, switching to an annoying falsetto. Take it before it's too late. The girl looked at her fiancé as if seeing him for the first time. She didn't know him like this, and she never imagined he could be like this. And the guy completely lost control, approached Laura closely and delivered a hefty slap to her face. Not calming down, he pushed her as well. Take the money, he repeated, driven by madness. The girl became frightened. She had never experienced physical violence in her life. No matter how much of a scoundrel her father was, he never laid a hand on her or her mother. The girl retreated to the hallway and then quickly rushed out onto the street, holding her hand to her burning cheek. After walking a couple of blocks, the girl took out her phone and called Leo. I hope you went to get the money, he said as soon as he answered. Forget about the money and forget about me too. I'm going to the police right now, and I will file a report against you for assault. What assault? I just slapped you to bring you to your senses. By the time you get to the police, there won't be any redness left on your cheek. Laura, I lost my temper for a moment. Yes, I agree. But you should also understand me. You've done something so foolish. It's not too late to undo everything. Think it through. I have nothing to think about. I don't want to see you anymore, although I'll have to, but not for long. And I don't want to work alongside you either. You will go and file a report yourself today. You know what kind of relationships I have with everyone in court, and they don't like you there. So either you leave on your own, or they will kick you out." Laura hung up the phone. Leo didn't go to work that day. He sat at the girl's house, waiting for her return. He hoped she would relent. She was kind, after all. However, when Laura arrived home, she wasn't alone. 
she entered with a couple of her male friends from college. The girl didn't want to be alone with Leo for another second. Laura's friends made Leo gather his belongings and kicked him out of the house. Soon enough, Lisa admired the hallway of the German clinic with admiration. Laura, just look at how impressive everything is here. And the equipment. They will definitely save George here. Yes, of course, they will, the young interpreter, who had been guiding them through the clinic, smiled. We have the best doctors. Let me introduce you to the doctor who will perform surgery on your son. Come, he's already waiting for us. The interpreter led the girls to the designated office, where a young doctor in a pristine white coat, without a single wrinkle, awaited them. He was very good-looking and resembled more of a movie actor playing a doctor than an actual physician. Lisa, thinking that no one else understood them besides the interpreter, blurted out the first thing that came to her mind. He seems too young. We need a more experienced doctor. The doctor flashed a charming, bright smile that made Laura's heart skip a beat, and he spoke in perfect American. Don't worry, I have enough experience. And I've performed similar operations many times before. Oh. And you speak American? Lisa blushed, feeling embarrassed. Please forgive me, I didn't think. Lisa fell silent, completely flustered and unsure of what to say next, while Laura tried to salvage the situation. You speak American so fluently, without any accent. Of course, the doctor smiled again. I am American myself. I worked in New York five years ago, and then I was invited to this clinic in Germany. When they found out you were my fellow countrymen, they assigned me to perform the surgery on your son. It will be easier for us to communicate. I assure you once again, there's no need to worry. I have experience. My name is Henry. Now, let's discuss our next steps. We cannot delay the surgery. Today, our little patient will rest from the journey, and all the necessary tests will be conducted. The operation will be scheduled for tomorrow morning. Lisa and Laura left the young doctor with enthusiasm. After their lengthy conversation, Henry proved to be a serious and trustworthy physician. He must be really good at what he does. They wouldn't have recruited just any American doctors to work in such a clinic, Lisa chirped. Did you see how he looked at you, Laura, when he asked about your relationship to the child? He couldn't take his eyes off you. Clearly, he liked you. Don't make things up, blushed Laura, who herself had sensed Henry's interest. No, I'm not making anything up. I'm telling it like it is. By the way, how is your Leo? Did he finally leave you alone? Stopped calling? I don't know. I blocked him on my phone, Laura frowned at the mention of her ex-fiancé. Breaking up with him had been difficult for Laura. Difficult in the sense that he had been pursuing her relentlessly until she left for Germany. Under Laura's pressure, Leo quit his job, but he still came to her house every evening. He begged for forgiveness, professed his love, appearing just as good-natured as he had been at the beginning of their relationship. But now Laura knew his true face, she had seen him insulting and striking her. But forget about him. Don't think about him anymore. Lisa interrupted Laura, noticing the change in her expression. Let's talk about the upcoming surgery and Henry. I want to believe that everything will go well. It will, Laura said confidently. Lisa walked down the street, holding mischievous George's hand. The boy was always trying to escape from his mother and test the depth of puddles with his new shiny boots. George, don't be naughty. Don't jump in the puddles. Look, you're already all wet. But the little boy didn't listen and constantly pulled his mother's hand towards those enticing puddles. He was very active, and the previous diagnosis only reminded them of the hospital reports stored in Laura's home. In that very house, now only Lisa and her son lived. They were returning there after their walk. Upon entering the house, Lisa sighed heavily, observing the mess created by her mischievous little one. Okay, George, I'll quickly feed you, and then you can play quietly in your room, the woman ordered. I need to tidy up here and clean everything. Aunt Laura is coming from Germany soon. She's already here, a cheerful voice echoed from the entrance door. 
Lisa turned around abruptly and saw Laura and Henry entering through the unlocked door. Laura, how is this possible, the woman exclaimed, waving her hands. You said you would come in a couple of days. Yes, we came earlier. Aren't you happy? Laura replied. Yes, I'm happy, very happy. I just didn't have time to clean up. George, he's like a hurricane. Oh, don't clean anything. Everything is fine here. Besides, we might have to sell the house. Lisa, are you sure you haven't changed your mind about moving in with this new man of yours? Well, he's not really new. We've been dating for half a year. He has been persuading me for a long time. He's so responsible, reliable, a complete opposite of your father. Laura, I will introduce you to him, of course. You will introduce us. Laura snorted. And what about dad? Haven't you heard from him in a while? Of course I have. He shows up from time to time. Now that he realized there is no need to treat the child anymore and that he has a healthy, cheerful son, especially when Alex found out that we live in this house, I could barely keep him away. After me, Alex has already gone through two women. He couldn't get along with either of them. Mind you, both of those women kicked him out. They must have been more insightful than me and your mother, immediately seeing through him. Well, why are we just standing here by the door? Come in, I'll feed you. Where is your luggage? While Lisa was setting the table, Laura went into the children's room, then into the kitchen. She returned with George in her arms. Why are you carrying him? Lisa smiled. He's already a big and heavy boy for that. Oh, he's not heavy at all, Laura laughed. He's like the most pleasant burden in the world, right, George? I miss him so much. Will you ever come visit us? At that moment, Henry approached Laura and took the child from her arms. I miss my most beloved patient too, he said. George, give uncle a hug. He's your savior. He performed surgery on you, Lisa said to the little one, who didn't understand such complex words. Henry smiled, playing with George, while Lisa admired them. It's amazing how lucky Laura was to meet someone like him. That's what fate means. To go to a foreign country and meet your soulmate there. The spark between the young Dr. Henry and Laura appeared instantly. Lisa noticed it at their first meeting. And how swiftly everything spun between them. The young couple knew they had little time. Laura would soon have to leave, but it became clear right away that they were kindred spirits and understood each other without words. When Laura returned to America with her operated little brother and Lisa, Henry followed suit, unable to bear the separation. Their feelings for each other were so strong that Laura left her job, her home, and went to Germany with him. Currently, the girl is pursuing a second higher education, this time in medicine. She realized that her calling is also to help people, just like her husband does. They became husband and wife a year ago. Lisa couldn't attend their wedding due to financial constraints, but George was growing up and had already started going to daycare, so it won't be long before Lisa can return to work. Besides, she met a man who may not be wealthy or younger than her, but he is reliable. So life is falling into place for all of us, Lisa thought aloud. Oh, you have no idea, exclaimed Laura. You know, Lisa, I'm already working at a clinic. Henry helped, at least for now, but I'm studying and gaining experience. You should see how much I love medicine. Someday, I'll be able to heal people and alleviate their suffering. I have no doubt about that, Lisa smiled. You know, I definitely curse myself for getting involved with Alex, but at least I met you. You became the best family for me and George, and you changed me for the better. I wasn't like this before, I guess I resembled your father more. I often thought that if I were in your place back then, well, honestly, I wouldn't have given him the money. That's enough, girls, Henry said sternly. There's no need to dwell on the past. Let's think about our plans for this visit instead. Laura, perhaps it's time to decide about the house, Lisa said. Have you changed your mind about selling it? I did change my mind, absolutely. I was wandering through the rooms just now. Everything feels so familiar here. 
It's as if I'll hear my mom's voice any moment. On the other hand, leaving the house empty is not an option. Maybe we could consider getting tenants, Henry suggested. We have time for that. Let's find a positive family who can take care of the house, and Lisa can visit here occasionally. Yes, that's what we'll do, Laura nodded, lovingly surveying the cherished home.